All right, hi everyone. Welcome to your next installment of Chapter 10 as we study statistics. Um, today's class is Section 10.2, um, and we will be covering a lot of material, so hang in there. There's a lot to discuss. Um, let me start sharing my screen so we can get right to it. And then don't forget that we have a live class on Friday where we will be discussing section 10.3. And with that, we'll be wrapping up chapter 10. So Monday, you will have a test to deal with, okay? Um, let's pull up the notes that we have for today. All right, so here we go. These have been posted for you. Um, um, in the content area and in the assignment box. It will, you know, as we've been doing, the, the place where these things have been posted will also serve as our drop box for you to turn them in. And you have until I think it's 12.30 to turn it in on Friday, about a half hour before we have to log on for our live class, okay? So without any further ado, let's get going. So we are gonna talk about analyzing and interpreting data today. As you know from our conversation on section 10.1, all right? And I, I have a quick little review for you right here. It says, recall, we discussed the four steps to, so to solving a statistical problem, right? And we talked about how you're going to formulate questions. Usually they come from daily life. You're gonna collect data. We discussed that there are various methods that you can use to collect the data, survey, interview, observation, measurements. We talked about how you have to decide what group you're collecting this data from. Is it sample data or is it population data? We discussed that a population is the entire group that you're hoping to draw um, data from and then be able to um, make anal um, predictions and analyze the information that you receive. Or is it a sample of that group because the group is too large to realistically be able to collect data from? Um, and, that, and you need to know that because it inter you interpret the data you receive from those two different groups differently. So we talked all about that, about collecting data, and then we kind of really wrap things up in discussing organizing and displaying data because we talked about how basically once you've collected that data, you have two types of data. You have quantitative data, which is objective, it's measurable, um, it comes from things like how tall people are, the size of shoes people wear, um, you know, how many males versus females, hair color, things like that. It's measurable data. It's objective. It's got nothing to do with who or what you're collecting data from. That is called quantitative. And then we have qualitative data, which is subjective. A lot of times it has to do with people's preferences. It has to do with things that they prefer, one thing over another, and you're collecting that information. So we discussed how to organize and display the data, you need to know which of these two types of data you have collected. And then depending on which of these two types of data you've collected, you would use various different kinds of line graphs, um, plots, and uh, pictograms to organize and display this data that you received. And then those line plots, um, pictographs, line graphs, bar graphs, pie charts, allow you to make some sort of conclusions and um, find information easily in regards to this data that you have. So it allows you to organize it and to display it. And once you have it organized and ready to display, it then allows you to move into the last section, which is to analyze it and interpret it, which is where we're gonna be spending the bulk of our time today. And we did discuss that depending on the type of data you had would influence the type of method that you chose to organize and display. So we discussed how histograms, leaf and stem plots, line plots, line graphs, all lend themselves to quantitative data, whereas pie charts, bar graphs, pictograms lend themselves better to qualitative data. All right, so in this section, we're really gonna hunker down and sink our teeth into analyze and interpreting the data that we've now formulated questions for, collected in one of the methods we've discussed, organized and displayed in one of the methods that we discussed because we are aware of the type of data that we've collected. And now we're ready to really do some in-depth analysis of this data that we've collected and that we've organized. Okay, and so basically the definition for measuring, for doing that is that we start by measuring what's called central tendency. Okay, and there's three ways of doing that. Um, and they are all useful. 
and the definition for measuring central tendency is numbers that give an indication of overall average. Please note that we have the word average in quotation marks and that's because all of these measures of central tendency are measuring averages um, but there, there's a big difference between using that word in the generic form that we're using it to describe measurement of central tendency and then using that word the way we're generally accustomed to what it means, which we'll be discussing more specifically in a minute. Okay, so please note that this average, it's in quotation marks, is not the one you're thinking of. We're going to be talking about that in a minute. Okay, so the first measurement of central tendency that we're going to discuss is mode. Okay, and the mode of a set of data is defined as the data value that occurs most frequently. Basically, this is the actual data value that you see more than once. And to be considered frequent, it has to be more than once because the assumption is all data values, if they're in a particular set, occurred at least once. That's why they're in that set. So for them to be a mode, it has to happen more than once, and it has to be the value that happens the most, which is why it's most frequently. Look at these examples that we have here. We have two classes, and these are some test scores for reading class, okay? And uh, here we have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 scores in class 1. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 scores in class two, okay? The mode, according to the definition, is defined as the value that occurs most frequently more than once. So in class one, you will see that I underlined 4.9 because I see that happened twice. I've also underlined 5.2 because that seems to have happened twice. And I have underlined 5.3 because I see that that happened three times. Okay, you will note that in our definition, I put two little bullets there. I said there can be more than one mode. There can be sets of data that have more than one mode. It also says there can be none. There are sets of data that have no mode because if every value in a particular data set only occurs once, then we do not fulfill the definition of the mode, which is that it has to be the value that occurs most frequently and it must be more than once. So it is entirely possible to have a set of data that has no mode. It's also entirely possible to have a set of data that has more than one mode if you have multiple values that all occur the same number of times. But when we are looking for mode, we are looking for the value that occurs the most number of times, hence the most frequently. So in class one, even though we have several values that occur more than once, we've got 4.9 occurring twice and 5.2 occurring twice, 5.3 is the one that occurs most frequently because it occurred three times in this set of value, in this set of values. So therefore, the mode for class one is 5.3. It is the most frequent value. Okay. If we look at class Number two, and the values that we see there, we see that we have a 4.7 seems to be the only value that occurs more than once. So very easily we can identify the mode. It's 4.7. It's the only value that occurs more than once. It occurs three times. It's the most frequently occurring value. Therefore, it is the mode for the set of data for class two. Now, if we were to combine class one and class two together and make all of their values the set of values that we're looking at, the set of data that we're looking at, then you would note that, for example, I've got two 4.9s up here, okay? Then I have another 4.9 here. So therefore, one, two, three, 4.9 happens three times. Then I also have 5.3 happening three times here and 4.7 happening three times here. I have no value that occurs more than three times between both classes and I have three values that all three of them occur three times between both classes. So if I'm looking at both classes combined and making that the set of data that I'm studying, then I would have to say that that set of data has three modes. 4.7, 4.9, and 5.3. As all three values are the most frequently occurring values, 
all three of those values occur three times each. Okay, so hopefully mode is a simple concept. You've got it, you understand it. And that is one of the simplest ways that we can measure central tendency, okay? Meaning the tendency for the data to gather in the middle value, okay? As you saw here, the numbers that give an indication of overall average of the values present in that particular data set. Now, the next measure of central tendency that we have is the median. And we're gonna discuss two specific scenarios because depending on which of these two scenarios you have in your data set, is, it will influence how you find the median for that data set, okay? So the definition for median is when all data values are arranged in increasing numerical order, you can also do it in decreasing, but the most default way is to do it in increasing numerical order. So you take all your data values and you put them in increasing numerical order from least to greatest. Then the median is the value exactly in the middle. It's like physically in the middle. If you were to think of all your data values as a number line, the median is the value that is exactly in the middle of that number line, having the same number of values above it as it has below it, okay? So let's look at an example because it makes it a little more clear. In scenario number one, the total number of values in the data set we're gonna be looking at is an odd number, okay? So when the total number of values in your particular data set is an odd number, such that, for example, set A, such that the values in that set are one, two, three, three, four, six, and nine. We have a total of seven data values in the set. So our total number of data values is odd. When looking to find the median, we make sure that our data values are listed in increasing order. And you can see that they are from left to right. We're going from the least value, uh, numerical value, which is one, to the highest numerical value, which is nine. And now that I have them in numerical or increasing order, I look for the value that's directly smack dab in the middle, and it happens to be this three. This three has three values below it, and it has three values above it. So this three represents the median for this set of data. Now, as you can see, when your total number of data values is odd, it's a very easy thing to identify the median. You just have to line them up in increasing order from left to right, and then you literally find the value that is in the middle that has the same number of values below it as it has above it, and that is your median. So therefore, for scenario number one, this set of data, our median is three, meaning that that is our average uh, value, it is the value that measures our central tendency of our data, okay? Now, in scenario number two is what do you do when the total number of values in your data set is an even number? Because then there isn't really one value that's in the middle with the same number of values below it and above it, right? So what do you do? Here's what you do. When we have set B, okay, such that the values in set B are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, four, five, and five, the total number of data values for this set, for set B, is eight. This is an even number. So we have an even number of total data values in our set. We still start by putting all of our data values in increasing order from left to right. So you can see that all my data values are in increasing order, starting with the least, which is zero, ending with the highest, which is five. Now, what we have to do is we have to find the values, and it's always going to be two because we have an even number of total values. We find the values that are in the middle where they leave the same number of data values below and above. So you can see here that three and four are the ones that are in the middle because if I circle three and four, I have three value points below three and four, and I have three value points above three and four. So my median lives here, somewhere in the middle between three and four. So how do we find where my median is? We take these two values that are in the middle, okay? And then we take what's called the arithmetic, arithmetic average. This is the one that when we say the word average, you're normally thinking of. The arithmetic average of these two numbers. So we take the sum of them, three plus four is seven. And then we take that sum and we divide it by two, which is the number of values that we're considering. 
So seven divided by two is three and a half. Therefore, my median is three and a half. That would be the data value that would be smack dab in the middle, okay? Leaving me with the same number of values below as the same number of values above. So once again, when your data set has an even number of data values, you take the two values that are in the middle that leave you the same number of data values below and above, and then you find the arithmetic average of those two values by taking the sum of them and then dividing by two. When you do that, then you get the actual value that is the median for that data set. So for data set B, the median is three and a half, okay? So that's how you find the median in the two scenarios where you either have an odd number of data values or you have an even number of data values. Now let's move on to the last, the third measure of central tendency, which is called the mean. And once again, you notice I'm calling it the average and I've got those quotation marks around it. That's to tell you that the mean is officially the, the way that we normally think of when we talk about the word average. What I hope that you've now understood is that both mode, median, and now mean are all measures of central tendency, and they are all giving us an average value for a particular data set. But the only one that is the arithmetic average is what we call the mean, okay? So you will see here that the mean is defined as the arithmetic average of a data set, and here is officially how that is found. The arithmetic average of a data set, and this is the symbol that stands for it, the symbol here, the, the little x with a little line above it is the symbol for mean or for the arithmetic average, is found by taking the sum of all the data values and dividing them by the total number of data values in the set, okay? So for example, for this set of data here, we're going to find the mean for it. So we have a set of data where we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight values. We're gonna take the sum of all eight values. So the sum of this eight values is 312. Because there's a total number of eight of them, we're gonna divide by eight. 312 divided by eight is 39. So the mean of this data set is 39, okay? That is the average value the arithmetic average value, okay? Now of those three measures of central tendency, the one that is most easily influenced by outliers, this is data values that are too be far below or too far above the mean to honestly um, be part of the core data set, is the mean. The mean is the one that's most affected by outliers. The median and the mode are not as easily affected by outliers, and so sometimes when you have a data set that has these outliers, your median and mode will give you a better sense of the central tendency of that data set than the mean will, because the mean can be easily influenced. Why? Because we're taking the sum of all the data values, and as you know, that can be easily influenced by the numbers that we're adding together. But that is not a topic that we're going to discuss in this discussion of statistics. Um, you may see it in other discussions of statistics. All right, so let's move on to topic number two, where we're going to discuss dispersion. Dispersion is the mathematical term for what you've probably heard to as referred to the range. Basically, the definition of the dispersion is how the data spreads out or is distributed. Because not only do we want to know the measure of the central tendency where the things are gathered in the middle, but we have, want to have a sense of how it's spreading out on either end, either very far below that middle uh, tendency, that central tendency, or very far above. And dispersion is what allows us to do that. And we have various ways of looking at dispersion. The easiest and simplest way, of course, is to find the range of a particular data set, okay? The range in a particular data set is defined as the difference between the largest data value and the smallest data value of any given data set. So for example, if we look at this data set again of those uh, reading scores that we were looking at earlier, okay, to find the range of this data set, we would identify the smallest data value, there it is, 4.3, and we would identify the largest data value, there it is, 5.4, and then we would proceed to find the difference between them. So 5.4 minus 4.3, 
the difference between them is 1.1, that's the range. Now, the smaller the range, the less dispersion is happening in that particular data set. The larger the range, the larger dispersion is occurring in that data set, okay? So it gives you a sense, but it is the simplest way of looking at dispersion. We have more detailed and specific ways of doing that, and we're gonna go ahead and look at that now, okay? One of the ways that we can visually, and, and that's why this particular type of organization and display of data was not included in our discussion of section 10.1, is box and whisker plots, and that is because box and whisker plots are um, not only useful in organizing and displaying data, but they give us a real sense of the range that is occurring in a particular data set. And it does so by employing the use of the median as its measure of central tendency. So officially a box and whisker plot is a visual way to get a sense of how a set of data is distributed. Okay, here's how we make one. So I'm gonna walk you through the process. It's not very complicated. My issue with box and whisker plots um, actually is simply that I find some of the terms are sort of misnomers, but in and of itself, it's a very useful way of looking at data and it gives you some quick, simple um, uh, definitions of things that, that allow you to discuss uh, about a set of data intelligently and be able to analyze it well. So if we were given the task of making a box, a box and whisker plot from the following set of data, here's our set of data. The first thing we have to do is identify the median for the entire set of data. This set of data happens to be an even numbered set. So when I'm identifying my median, I find that I have two values in the middle that have the same number of values below it, which is five values below, and same number of values above it. Okay, so I've got one, two, three, four, five below, and one, two, three, four, five above. So I've got five values above, five values below. This is my median. My median lives somewhere here between these two. So because it's an even numbered set, I am gonna go ahead and follow scenario number two to find my median. I'm gonna take those two uh, data points, add them together, the sum of 5.2 and 5.3 is 10.5, divide them by two, 10.5 divided by two is 5.25. There is my median for the entire set of data, okay? So 5.25 is the median for the entire set of data. That's what you find in step one. Then in step two, you need to find what is your highest value and what is your lowest value. This is where we can see how box and whisker plots help us to start looking at the dispersion of a particular set of data, right? So I look at my set of data and I've identified that my lowest value is 4.3 and my highest value is 5.6. And I've made note of that in step two. In step three, I now need to find two additional median points. Because by finding the median in my first step, I in essence divided my data set into two halves, the lower half and the higher half, right? I basically divided it into two percentiles, which we'll be discussing later. The lower percentile or the lower 50% of my data and the higher percentile, the, the higher percent of 50% of my data. Now in step three, I'm finding two additional media points to basically take that lower half and split it again and then I'm gonna take that upper half and split it again. So that I'm gonna end up with basically four pieces of data out of my original set, and we call each of those pieces quartiles, okay? That's where that term comes from. So in step three, you're gonna find the median for all the scores that are between the lowest score and the median of the data set, okay? And so we go ahead and do that, and we, we take care of the data points that are the lowest score all the way up to the, where right below the median of the original data set. That includes all these scores. So I take all these scores, I find the media, the median of them. Once again, these scores are an even number. So the median constitutes two numbers. I'm going to add them together, divide by two. And I find that the median for this lower set, okay, the lower quartile, this lower set of data is five, okay? So now I've got my lowest score, then I have five, which is the median between the lowest and the median of the overall data, and then I have the median of the overall data. So that's how I've divided my, my data so far. Then you're going to find the median for all the scores between the median of the data and the highest value score. Okay, so once again, here is 
the first value above the median of the overall set and all the way to the highest value of the, of the data set. And I'm going to find the median between these scores. Once again, they're even. So once again, I have two scores in the middle. I'm going to add them together, divide by two, and I get 5.4 is the median for this higher 50% of data, right? So what you should be noting is that now I have four sets of data. I have the median that is right in the middle of the entire set. I have the lowest value. I have the highest value. And then I have the median between the lowest value and the median of the set. And I have the median between the median of the set and the highest value, okay? In step four, we are now going to commence to plot our data points. And we plot our data points basically on a number line, okay? So the first thing you're going to do is plot the median for the entire data set. So that's right here. Here it is, 5.25, the median for the entire data set, okay? Then you're going to plot your lowest point and you're gonna plot your highest point, okay? Now between your lowest point and the median of the data, you have the median for them, right? That would be the median of the lower quartile. So you take that median, plot it in, and that's how you make the first half of your box, between the median of the entire data set and the median of the lowest to the median, which was five, that makes the first half of your box. And from that first half of your box to the lowest point, that is your first whisker, okay? Then over here, you would find the, the median point between the median of the data set and the highest data point. And then once you find that, you plot it, and that makes the other half of your box. And then the distance between that median and the highest value point is your other whisker. Okay, so that you end up with, here's your box, here are your whiskers, okay? Remember, this is the lowest point on your data value set. This is the highest point of data value set. This right here, 5.25, is the median of the entire data set. Here, you have five, which is the median between the lowest point and the median of the value set. And here you have 5.4, which is the median between the median of the whole set and the highest value point. Now, we've basically divided this into four quartiles, which is what they're called. And here are their official names. Between the median of the lower set and the median of the entire data set, we call that the lower quartile. So this space right here, okay? Between the median of the entire data set and the median of the higher end of data, we call this the upper quartile, okay? And then below the lower quartile, this whisker is the low whisker, ending with the minimum value or the lowest value. And then above this upper quartile all the way to the highest value is the high whisker, okay? So in essence, you have four quartiles. You have this part here, then you have the lower quartile between the two mediums, then you have the upper quartile between the two mediums, and then you have the, this part here, the whisker, okay? So just by looking at this whisker plot, I now can see the dispersion. I can also see where my central tendency is. I can even see that it's slightly skewed, okay? And all of that can be determined by looking at in box and whisker plot, okay? Um, I, do I have, I don't think I do. I thought I might have a picture of a box and whisker plot from your textbook, but I don't believe that I do. However, if you wish to look one up, you can. It is in our chapter um, in section 10.2. I'm going to give you a page number real quick so you can identify it. Um, you can see a couple of examples of box and whisker plots on page 444 and 445, um, as well as you can see Yes, I think that's it. Those are the best examples of them. So you can look at those as your examples of, of box and whisker plots. All right, now I told you we'd talk about percentiles, so here we are. Percentiles, if you recall, okay, in box and whisker plots, we basically use the median to divide the data into the lower half, the lower 50%, and the upper half, 
the upper 50%, and then we went and divided each of those into two pieces, right? So we divided into quartiles, and basically we had 50% of the data, and each quartile is below and above the median for that quartile, right? So for the lower side of the whisker, uh, the box and whisker plot, we had the median for that lower side, and that divided 50% of it below and 50% of it above. Then we had the actual median for the whole data set, which divided 50% of the data below and 50% of the data above. And then we have the median for the upper set, which gives us 50% of that below it and 50% of that above it. So that's what a whisker plot does. It divides it into half, right, 50%. But if we take any given data set and we divide that into 100 equal parts, we are creating percentiles. That is the definition um, of dividing data into 100 equal parts we, no matter what, how many data values are in a particular data set, if we take those data values and divide it into 100 equal parts, we then have created percentiles, okay? And the way that we read percentiles is, for example, the first percentile basically separates the bottom 1% of the data from the top 99% of the data. So if you're in the first percentile of something, that means there's 99% of all the rest of that data above you, okay? If you're in the 80th percentile of a data set, then that means that you are, there is 80% of the data below you and 20% of the data above you, okay? That's how percentiles work. This is important for us teachers because a lot of the standardized testing gets reported this way. You get told about the percentiles where any given um, data values of the students that you're looking at where they landed, right? Um, so that's why it's important that you understand what percentiles are, what box and whisker plots are, because it actually allows you to better interpret standardized testing, which is something that we all teachers have to deal with. And you should be able to understand it and explain it clearly and what it means to the parents of your children, of course. All right, let's move on to what variance and standard deviation is. Remember that we are still talking about dispersion, right? So we've talked about how box and whisker plots help us to see that. We've talked about how percentiles kind of help us to see that. Now we're really gonna get to the nitty gritty of how we can look at dispersion through variance and standard deviation, which are the more useful ways of looking at it. We talked about range as well, which is the simplest way. This is more the standardized way of how we look at dispersion of a particular data set, okay? Now variance is defined as the sum of all the differences between each data value and the mean of that particular data set. And then taking those differences and squaring them. And then finding the sum of all of those. Okay, so the sum will then be divided by the total number of data values in the data set. I'm going to read this definition for you one more time and then actually look, show you the formula which makes it a little easier to understand. So once again, the definition of variance is that you take the sum of all the differences between each data value and the mean squared, and then you take that sum and divide it by the total number of data values in the data set. So here's how you find it, okay? You would take each data value and you would subtract from it the mean for that data set. And then whatever that difference was, you would square it. You would do this for each data value and then you would take those squares and you would add them all together. That is the sum that you are finding. The sum of the difference of each data value from the mean squared. You take all of those values and you add them all together and then you divide them by the total number of values in the data set. And the number that you get is called the variance. Okay? Now please note if you want more specific detailed uh, directions on how you would calculate the variance for any given data set, if you go to page 448 at the top, they walk you through the steps but it's exactly what I've just discussed. You would, if you had, for example, 10 data points in a particular data set, then you would have 10 squares because you would take each data point, subtract the mean from that data point, square it, and then do that for the next data point and the next data point. So you've done it for all 10. So you'd have 10 squares, right? 
10 squared differences. Then you would take those squared differences and add them all together. You want the sum of those squared differences. And then you would divide them by 10. And the value that you got would be the variance of that data set, okay? And the most valuable piece of information that the variance gives us is that it allows us to then calculate the standard deviation, okay? The standard deviation is defined as the square root of the variance. So basically, once you have that value, since we took all those squares, right, you take that value, you take the square root of that value, and now you have a value that we call the standard deviation, or SD. And it tells us how the measurements of any data point, how far below or above the mean or that central tendency it is. And this is very valuable information because it lets us know how widely spread the dispersion of the data is or how narrowly spread the dispersion of the data is just by looking at the standard deviation, okay? So if you look here, all right, a low standard deviation, so your standard deviation is small. That is how far you're deviating from the mean of that data set then that means that most of your values are close to that mean. That means you have a high level of central tendency. That also means that you have a low variance score, meaning that you don't have a lot of dispersion, meaning your range is small. So that means that most of your data points are a lot alike, okay? If you have a high standard deviation, okay, meaning that the difference between the mean of that data set and, a, and your first standard deviation is very large, then that means that your values are spread far from that mean of that data set. That means you have a high variance score, and that means that you have a large dispersion or a big range, meaning that your data values are all over the place, and you have a lot of values that are very far above and very far below that measure of central tendency, okay? The best way to look at it is to think about it as a graph. If we were to graph a data set, okay, and right here in the middle is central tendency, this is our mean. If we have a low standard deviation and a low variance, we're going to have a very tall peak around this mean, and we're not going to have a lot of data points out on the sides because we have low variance. We have a low standard deviation. That means our range is small and narrow, and our graph would look like a very tall, narrow peak. If we have a large variance, okay, and we have a large standard deviation, then if this is our mean, you can see that our data point is very spread out. We have a big wide range, and that means that we have a large dispersion of data, okay? Now, directly connected to standard deviation, we have what's called a z-score. A z-score actually allows us to find exactly where any given data value is as compared to the mean and separated from the z-score, okay? So the z-score is basically like giving us the specific place to find a data point um, from the mean and within any standard deviation. So the standard deviation will be the same value that is subtracted from the mean multiple times going down or added to the mean multiple times going up but a z-score will tell you exactly where any particular data value falls, okay? So it can be very useful because it lets you know exactly where you fall. Do you fall within the first standard deviation? Or are you falling within the second standard deviation? The z-score will tell you exactly where any given value falls, okay? And the way we calculate the z-score is you take your data value, you subtract the mean of that data set from it, and you divide it by the standard deviation and that gives you the z-score for that data value, okay? Why do we calculate it? Because it tells you exactly how many standard deviations you are away from the mean for any particular value in the data set. Some things to know about z-scores. Z-scores that are above the mean are always positive. Z-scores that are below the mean are always negative. So if you're calculated and you're getting negative Z-score, then that's telling you how many standard deviations away from the mean you are below it. If you calculate the Z-score and you get a positive value, then that's telling you how many standard deviations away from the mean you are above the mean of any given data set, okay? Now, 
these things, standard deviations, z scores, ranges are very helpful when we look at the distributions of a particular data set. The distributions, we usually look at it by graphing it in something similar to these graphs you see here. But we also graph it using other methods like a histogram. So I'm going to show you that in a minute. But let's talk about specifically what is a distribution, okay? A distribution of a data set allows us to further analyze the data versus its relative frequency, okay? What is relative frequency? Relative frequency is defined as the percent of the total amount of data that each data value represents. For example, okay, if we had a data set that has 100 values, and in those values, the value 14 occurs six times, then that means that the relative frequency of 14 showing up in that data set is six percent. That is the relative frequency of the 14. That means that 6% of our data is taken up by the value 14. Okay? Here's how you would calculate it. You take the total number of frequency for the total number of frequencies for a given value. In this case, we know that 14 in our data set occurs six times. So its total frequency is six. You divide by the total number of values. In this case, I chose 100 because it's an easy calculation, but it might not be. It could have been six times in 225 data values, or it could have been that the number 14 occurred six times in 25 data values. So you divide by the number of data values. In this case, I said we had 100, uh, 100 data values. So we're taking six and divided by 100. We get a decimal answer. We multiply times 100 to get the percentage, and that gives us the relative frequency. So this right here is important. Highlight it, circle it. This is, this is how you would calculate the relative frequency of any given data value, and it allows us to discuss then the distribution because the distribution allows us to talk about the data values themselves versus their relative frequency, okay? Now, what is a distribution? Let's look at figure 10.25 at the top of page 451. And I actually have that for you to look at because I think it would be simpler than me trying to draw it for you. So I'm gonna pull that up. Here it is, figure 10.25. So here is a data set where we find out the frequency, the relative frequency of those particular data values. So for example, this is the weight of students in kilograms. In 24 kilograms, we have two students. 2% 2 of students are in 24 kilograms. 3% of students weigh 26 kilograms. 16% of students weigh 34 kilograms, and 16% of students weigh 36 kilograms, and so on and so forth. So you can be sure that right here at 16 is where we have our mean. Okay, and where our mode and our median would exist if we were to calculate it for this particular set of data. This here is what we call our distribution. Okay, and you will see that it allows us to look at the particular data values and the percentage at which we can expect them to occur. This allows for a lot of analysis and interpretation of data and also prediction of what we can expect to happen. It's also how we can determine whether a particular statistic that we find is normal and to be expected for that particular phenomenon or is completely new, okay? In science, this is where standard deviations and these scores become very important. In science, if you find something in a particular type of phenomenon, you would have to run one of these data analysis. And if the thing you found lands more than five standard deviations away from the mean, then it's considered to be a brand new discovery. If it lands less than five standard deviations away from the mean of that particular set of data in a distribution like this, then it's considered to be expected. And that would be the expected thing that we would expect to happen at that level. And again, you'll probably get into this further and in more detail in other subjects. All right, let's get back to our notes. Okay, so things that you need to note. A distribution that has a smooth bell-shaped is called 
It has a smooth bell-shaped curve. It has symmetrical distribution, and the mean, the mode, and the median are all equal to each other. We call this a normal distribution. And I'm gonna show you some figures about that right now, okay? There are distributions that are not normal and they look differently, but normal distributions look like this. And that's what I want to show you here, okay? So I'm gonna pull those up. This is a normal distribution. This means that our mean, median, and mode is most likely right here between these two scores, okay? Here is an example of a normal distribution. And the reason why a normal distribution is a specific type of distribution is because what scientists have found, statistical scientists, scientists of all, all walks of life, they have found that when something can be statistically now analyzed as a normal distribution, which is what this looks like, then the percentages that we can expect information to fall into always follow this pattern right here, okay? This pattern is telling you that if your data works itself out to be a normal distribution, where your mean, median, and mode are equal, and they're represented here by this middle line, and you can see here there's the mean symbol, then you can expect 34% of your data to be one standard deviation above that mean, and 34% of your data to be one standard deviation below that mean, to fall within those gaps. Or the way we like to look at it, it's called the empirical rule, is that 68% of all your data that you find, if indeed you have a normal distribution, will fall within plus or minus one standard deviation from the mean. If you're looking at a normal distribution, then you can expect an additional 13.5% to be below your mean at two standard deviations, an additional 13.5% to be above the mean um, at, at two standard deviations, or according to the empirical rule, that means that you can expect 95% of your data to fall within two standard deviations of your mean, okay? And finally, if you are indeed looking at a data set that has a standard distribution like this, okay, a normal distribution as we like to call, then that means you're gonna have an additional 2.35% of data that may fall up to three standard deviations below the mean and up to three standard deviations above the mean, okay? And that means that according to the empirical rule, 99.7% of all your data should fall within three standard deviations above and below your mean if your data is spreading out in a normal distribution. This is important because like I mentioned before, anything that is below ab above three standard deviations or below three standard deviations would be considered statistically important or of note. For example, you can the normal uh, we the heights of people, the average heights of men in this country is something that works out to be in a normal distribution. So therefore, three standard deviations away, I think that usually puts you at about six, six, three, I think, I'm going off the top of my head. Therefore, anybody whose height is above that, for example, uh, I think it's Ming Yao, he's a basketball player, go correct me if I'm wrong, uh, who I think is like seven foot three, he is here, he's above three standard deviations away from the average height of a man. Therefore, his height is notable. It is not average. It is something that happens rarely because he is a three standard deviations away from that. As well as like somebody who would be in the World Guinness Book of Records for being very small or very short for having uh, some, some kind of dwarfism, they would probably, their height probably falls here at above three standard deviations below the mean or the average height of someone, okay? So, this is one of the wonderful things about a normal distribution is that we can know all this information just by knowing that a data set falls into a normal distribution. We know all of this right away. We know that 68% of the data will land within one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of the data will land within two standard deviations from the mean. And 99.7% of all the data will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. And anything that falls beyond that is only 0.15% likely to be expected. Therefore, you know that if you have data values that are landing there, there's something strange and rare about those data values, okay? And this is 
how we look at the same normal distribution and instead of putting standard deviations, we just put in the z scores, okay? But if you're one standard deviation away from the mean, your z score is one. So if you've got a z score of let's say 1.3, if your data value is a z score of 1.3, that means that you're landing somewhere here. You're slightly above one standard deviation away, but you're below two standard deviations away. And you're within that 95% of data distribution. All right, my dears, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. Okay, with that, we have completed our notes for this section of 10.2. I know it's a lot of information coming at you, but hopefully it's not the first time that you've been exposed to this information. I know this gets taught a lot at a, different, a lot of different levels and a lot of different math classes, but it is important that you have a good grasp of this information because you will be teaching this information and it has to be clear in your head. Plus statistical understanding is very useful as you're gonna find out when we discuss our next section in chapter 10, because there are ways in which the graphs that are used to organize and display statistics can be misleading. There are ways in which the distributions and the information that you're given about statistics can be misleading. And so it's important that you understand where it comes from, how it's calculated, and therefore you can make sure that you can avoid being misled. Okay, homework has been posted on the taskbar. Homework has also been posted here on this assignment. So, and it is due um, by 1230 before our live session on Friday. Our live session on Friday will start at 1 p.m. All right, have a nice day, guys.